hopefully I'll make it marginally relevant, um, uh, maybe not to your like day-to-day -day needs at the moment, but sort of societal changes that are coming over the next sort of 10 or 20 years. So yeah, hopefully you find it interesting. Um, so hello, yeah, my name's Andy. Um, I uh, run a sort of reasonably well-known US consultancy in Brighton called Clear Left. Um, I spend most of my time working, you know, with sort of like boards of kind of relatively large companies, helping them get their digital shit together, basically. So helping them kind of mostly operationalize design and help, you know, extract the value design has to offer for those big companies. At the moment, the bulk of the work we do are kind of like delivering digital experiences, whether they're products or services. And most of these at the moment are obviously delivered either through people or through some kind of graphical user interface. However, you know, occasionally, you know, increasingly voice interfaces. However, over the next 20 years, I believe more and more of these consumer services will be delivered by robots. So I guess my area of interest in this space is kind of looking at the field of human-computer interaction and seeing how we can design better human-to-robot experiences. And so, you know, what I'm going to do is give you a whistle-stop tour of the history of robotics, past, present, and future, and then touch on some of the kind of the, the economic, the moral, the societal challenges that we're going to be sort of looking at over the next 20 or 30 years. So, um, as a species, humanity has been dreaming of mechanical servants since the time of the Iliad. Um, automata as toys and curios uh, were all the range in the cosmopolitan city of Alexandria um, between the 3rd and 1st century BC. Um, in seven, I was saying 47 BC, to honour the then ruler Cleopatra, a 5.4 metre statue of Isis was erected in the city square. And apparently this statue could rise on its own, it could dispense milk from its breast to the, the mouths of the adoring fans of Cleopatra, and then sit back down. So pretty impressive for um, 47 BC. Slightly jumping quickly forward, because there wasn't an awful lot happening for the next sort of, you know, um, a thousand years or so in terms of robotics. But during the Renaissance, clockwork was becoming the prevailing technology. Um, as such, many intellectuals started to kind of explore the human body, you know, thinking of it as like a clockwork device, you know, trying to almost kind of create crude parallels between how the human body worked and how clockwork worked. And often they do this by trying to create, uh, sort of recreate and replicate human bodily functions. The clockwork monk from 1560 is a really great example. It's actually the earliest remaining example of a sort of a, a automata from that period. And these automata may sort of raise tricky kind of moral questions as, as to whether it was actually possible to create artificial life. And whether somehow, if you could, did that make you gods? Did that kind of, was that her her heresy? I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of the early automata were actually created in the form of, of religious sort of uh, icons to try and avoid any kind of awkward sort of conversations with the church around whether they were actually trying to sort of recreate God or just praise God. Jump forward a few hundred years more, an automata had become increasingly common in the courts of 18th century Europe. Um, they had become increasingly sophisticated, and this is called the dulcima player, which is a you know a, a, a quite a sort of a sophisticated. Um, an uh, automatic instrument player that would play this sort of beautiful kind of stringed instrument. And I've actually had the chance to kind of hear it played live, and it's absolutely beautiful. And it, it plays a number of different tracks. And um, these were sort of almost sort of objects that you would have in the court. Your, your visitors would come round, and they'd be massively impressed with your, your sort of sophistication by having an object like this. And I think a lot of sort of early home robots sort of have a similar sort of vibe. You know, I remember when like, you know, the early kind of, you know, Alexa sort of came out. You'd come around and, and your, your friends would kind of like crowd around and you kind of poke it and jab it and, and sort of, you know, uh, explore. And it kind of was almost like a, a show that you were kind of at the cutting edge of technology. Even if those things were not especially useful, they were curios. <coughs> However, <coughs> excuse me, capturing kind of realistic human sort of motion has always been really difficult. It's kind of been the holy grail. And this is a challenge we're still facing today. I'm sure everyone is in, in the room is sort of familiar with the concept of the uncanny valley. The idea that as you kind of get close to kind of a humanoid sort of, you know, sort of realistic type movement, it starts to get really creepy. You know, you don't quite know why it's creepy, but you just look at these things and you think, they, you know, they give you that weird feeling. Androids like Erica are a really good example of this. You know, when you, when you look at this sort of, sort of creation, sort of move and talk and, and interact, it just feels off, it feels weird. So we're not getting close enough. Okay, my 
my connection is gone. So this is one of the reasons why I think a lot of early um, automata didn't try to kind of replicate human movement, but they tried to sort of look to the animal world. Um, this is a, an 18th century um, uh, automata called the, uh, the Silver Swan, and it's a beautiful example of, of sort of state-of-the-art automata. So this um, swan would sort of move around relatively realistically. It would sort of duck its head into the kind of the moving, um, the moving sort of waves, and it would actually capture little fish. It would open up its neck, the fish would be swallowed down, then it would go back and start catching other fish. So it's really sort of quite beautiful. Similarly, I think in the early stages of kind of home sort of robotics, we've done a similar thing. You know, we've, um, we've co copied kind of like animalistic behavior because it's much easier to kind of like um, fake than it is to capture human behavior, particularly using tools like Plios. This is Plio, it's probably about 10 or 15 years ago now, but a very, very famous sort of early sort of home sort of um, animatronic. And I think there's some real intelligence around choosing a dinosaur as your kind of your, your avatar or your shape, because we don't really know how dinosaurs move. So there's nothing about this that feels like, you know, too familiar that we know when it kind of goes wrong or doesn't quite sort of um, meet our expectations. There's a very, very famous kind of um, exercise or, or, or um, piece of research in kind of human-computer interaction whereby they got a room full of people and they asked the people to play with the Plio dinosaur for the you know, five or ten minutes. They got really attached and they asked to smash it with a hammer. And almost nobody would, would smash the, the, the robot with a hammer, even though everybody knew that it was just a toy. Um, you know, and they kept giving them increasingly large amounts of money because there's something about their physical form. And particularly with these robots, they've got big eyes, they're kind of slightly childlike. You bond with these animals or you bond with these creations. So even though you know that it's basically a smart toaster, you somehow can't not empathize with it. So I think form factor in designing robots is going to become increasingly important. And there's something, like I said, around the, the affordances, the signaling of the level of intelligence. Um, my friend Matt Jones that works in the AI team um, of Google talks about designing things that are as smart as a puppy. Um, this idea that you kind of know puppies are kind of like not incredibly smart, they can do certain things, but they, they can't really interact on any sort of really sort of deep level, they can't talk, they can't kind of like solve complex problems. So designing systems that kind of have affordances that give you a sense of the limit, level or limits of, of their capability can be really interesting. You know, so on some level, it's probably not worth creating humanoid robots, you could argue, unless they have a level of intelligence that can be backed up by their form factor. On the other hand, there's another concept in human-computer interaction called the ELISA effect, which was uh, created after um, one of the first experiments in chatbots, where this chatbot got, got given about 50 sort of stock answers, and yet people who were chatting with it really, really thought it was a real human being. They thought it was a... Um, uh, a, a um, human kind of therapist. And so, actually, weirdly, on the other hand, is that with some very, very simple kind of hints at intelligence, people tend to read much more into an object than is actually there. So this is known as the Eliza effect. So some of the more advanced uh, automata of the age had very crude programming hardwired into it, baked into their mechanisms. So this is an example of a, a, an automata called the writer. And it was actually able to write text up to 40 characters long. And it was programmed by little sort of spinning disks at the back. So you'd open up the back and there were these little disks that you'd spin. And it could basically, you know, write a tweet. And people loved it because you could reprogram it to write anything. So you'd write letters to loved ones or hate mail or what have you. So anything you could do on Twitter, you could basically do on this beautiful piece of clockwork. Um, in fact, one of the leaders of the field of the day was a, a Frenchman called Jacques Vacasson. And he had something called the digesting duck, or sometimes also known as the shitting duck. And Voltaire said, without the shitting duck of Vaucasson, there will be nothing to remind you of the glory of France. So this shitting duck was considered like the state of the art, almost like the pride of France. And basically, you would feed this duck food, and you know, it would go down through a digestive process, and out would pop duck poo. Interestingly, it was faked, so a lot of the digestion was happening, but there was a little kind of a compartment full of duck poo at the end, and it would just plop out some duck poo. Interestingly, these things might seem kind of slightly sort of silly or superficial, but the work that Vacanson did on the shitting duck of, of France um, actually then got baked into um, one of the first programmable looms. And these looms then went on to kind of inspire Babbage to create the difference engine. 
as such, early automata robots and modern programming computing have a lot more tied together than you might sort of first think. <coughs> of course, early automata also had their fakes. We're all aware of the famous Mechanical Turk. It seemed like an automata that played chess, but there was just a very, very tiny chess master sat in there actually doing all the moves. Um, Interestingly, I think a lot of modern AI is pretty much the same. It uses a technique which we sometimes call the Wizard of Oz technique, where basically a lot of the marketing buzz says, oh, this is a clever bit of AI. But actually, you'll have a room full of 30, 40 AI trainers, you know, air quotes trainers, and they'll basically do most of the work. So I had a, um, for a while, I had a, um, uh, an artificial intelligence PA called X.AI. Um, uh, Amy or Andrew um, was the name of the, the AI. And basically, if you got an email sort of asking for a meeting, you would CC Amy or Andrew, and it would set the meeting up for you. Um, but weirdly, it didn't do it instantly. It seemed to only work like when America was awake. And clearly what was happening is, um, actually there was a team full of people who were reading the emails, like probably they had an AI system that was kind of recommending responses, but a human being actually had to go through and go, yes, no, yes, no, maybe, I don't understand. So a lot of current AI is a bit of, uh, of Wizard of Oz. But that doesn't mean that that's bad, because the rate at which AI is increasing is such that I imagine in a year or two's time, that room of 40 or 50 AI trainers will be out of work and it will all be automated. So I think this, to some extent, there's a, there's a rationale or logic behind doing Wizard of Oz stuff now, because the technology will catch up really quickly. As again, I'm sure you're all aware, the term robot was first coined in a Czech play from 1920 called Rossum's <laughs> Universal Robots. Um, uh, and it came, comes from the Czech word for forced labor. So back in the day, robots, you know, in Rossum's Universal Robots, were actually more like biological creatures that were kind of um, augmented with technology rather than purely robotic. But these days, we assume that they're purely robotic, and anyone that's augmented with technology is more of a cyborg. Um, and very, very quickly, you know, from, from robots kind of entering into popular culture, um, they became a cultural lens through which we could sort of view all of the frustrations and concerns around society. Fears around industrialization, the dehumanizing effect of technology, and what might result to society. So during the Industrial Revolution, we were afraid, really, that humans would be turned into unthinking machines. And actually, if you look at a lot of kind of early sort of Marxist writing, a lot of that is sort of played out maybe by some of the sort of science fiction of the day. Now, a lot of this stuff didn't turn out to become true. You know, I'm sure there were sort of phases during the Industrial Revolution when it was pretty horrible being someone that was kind of working at a loom, but it might be nicer working on a loom factory floor than actually working on a machine that could kind of like require physical power and could maybe chop your fingers off. So, you know, we have kind of gone through a certain level of profession. You could argue, though, that today we are now moving towards a sense of becoming sort of mere robots, you know, to do the, the bidding of AI. You know, you think about kind of like factory warehouse workers um, that nowadays will often wear like a little earbud in their ear and a computerized voice will tell them where in the factory, where in the warehouse to go and, 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 and what to pick up. So often like humans are basically now doing the bidding of robots. And that's not too far away from like a taxi driver or an Uber driver following a sat nav. The only reason the Uber driver is there is because they haven't cracked self-driving technology. All the Uber driving is doing is taking directions from a robot, an AI, and you know, following those directions. And very, very soon, those people will be sort of removed from the equation. So I think if you're interested in sort of thinking where we're heading, um, it's probably worth looking at science fiction. So this is a method two from Korea. It's basically a exoskeleton. And you, know, you look at something like that, then you look at something like this from Aliens, you can see the direct parallels. So I think, in fact, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of technologists were born in sort of, you know, brought up on, raised on like 80s and 90s science fiction. And what's actually happening is that is now becoming science fact. The Elon Musk of the world, when they come into power, they sort of hark back to this kind of like science fiction image of the future and are trying to kind of build the technologies that they grew up with. And so I think if you want to understand where the future's going, taking a healthy interest in science fiction is probably a good place to start. Now, <coughs> Excuse me. Fears around technology are nothing new. A hundred years ago, before Russell, yeah, so a hundred years, you know, before Russell's Universal Robots, we had the Luddites. 
And the Luddites, as I'm sure you'll know, were a bunch of loom workers that threw their clogs, their, 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 I can't remember, their luds, their, you know, um, whatever, the, whatever the term was, into the, I'm getting confused with the sabotars and the sabots, but the Luddites threw their kind of like their, their equipment into the looms to break the loom for fear they'd be losing their jobs. So there's kind of been a long kind of history of workers being worried around um, technology doing themselves out of business. The thing that I think kind of makes me sort of slightly more worried is now it's not the workers that are worried, it's the industrialists themselves. It's not poorly, factory, poorly educated factory workers raising concerns, but the factory owners, the ones who are arguably, arguably most likely to benefit from mass automation. And some of their concerns, I think, are, are generated maybe from sort of good ethical moral reasons, but also I think some of them are just from hard economics. If you get to the point when you have a massively reduced workforce because it's all being automated, who is going to pay for your taxis? Who is going to buy your cars? Who is going to be a, a productive member of society in consuming your products? So the fact that we now have people like Elon Musk and people like Bill Gates rising the alarm bells around mass automation, I think is, is something that maybe indicates that this is slightly different to what it was 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years ago. As such, I do think we kind of need to start thinking about um, how we're going to sort of approach the challenges that sort of are going to be raised over the next 20 to 50 years. And I think as designers, we have a really important role to play in that conversation and almost to try and bring a humanist approach to design. A lot of technologists are focused far too much on what's technically possible. And I think it's our job as designers to focus much more on what's desirable and what's right for humanity. And so taking a more humanist approach to technology, I think, is going to be increasingly important. So these fears, again, you know, get sparked and they can make their way into popular culture. Here is going back in time to prevent the robot uprising and put the genie back in the bottle. Now, if you did want to go back in time and put the genie back in the bottle, um, you might want to go and, and um, kill this robot. So this robot wasn't the first robot created, but it was the first robot to turn on its human owner and shoot it with a gun. So this was Alpha. So Alpha used to do this trick where it would have a gun and it would light the, um, light the cigarette of its human owner by firing a shot. And one day it missed, shot its human owner, owner in the arm and there was gunpowder burns down the arm of the professor. So I think if you were trying to find a good place to go back and, and, and start the, you know, stop the robot um, uh, uprising, coming and getting rid of Alpha might be a good idea. The actual first robot is a British invention, 1928. This is Eric. Now, Eric was pretty amazing. It could rise from its seat, much like the robot in Isis. It could interact with people, much like the robot um, Isis from, from Alexandria, rather. Um, and it can actually answer 50 to 60 pre-prepared questions with a robotic synth voice. Not a million miles away from modern chatbots. A lot of modern chatbots basically have like 50 or 60 pre-planned sort of conversations. So it's amazing to think you can have a conversation with a robot, with the first robot in 1928. And in a little bit of kind of like maybe life imitating R or R imitating life, you'll see the R-U-R sort of stamped on the front of the robot. There's no um, firm proof that this is the case, but many people think that this stands for Russum's Universal Robots based on the play that I mentioned where the term robot came from. Now, a lot of early robots were really just novelties. They were kind of gimmicks. They were sort of ways of drawing crowds. So this is Electro from the, um, from the 1938 World's Fair, and it had literally thousands and thousands of people queuing up to see this modern sort of marvel. These days, if you spend much time in Japan, I spend quite a little bit of time in Japan, Actually, robots are used in a quite similar way. If you go into any soft bank, which is a big banking brand, like equivalent of HSBC in Japan, or if you go into a lot of kind of supermarkets, they'll have a Pepper robot. Pepper's like really the sort of first commercial robot available, and it's brilliant. Um, and so, you know, I think we're using robots these days really as kind of like a marketing gimmick. And if you look at the robot, it's not super sophisticated. It's basically a, a self-driving Roomba with a stick a little animatronic head and a tablet stuck to its chest. So I think we've got a long way to go. Um, I'll come on to another thought I had in a second, but, um, but being human, you know, what the first thing we do, you know, when we get robots, we stick a gun on it. So this is Fedor. This is a, ro a, a, a robot that's been produced in, um, in Russia. And, um, as you can see, it's, a, it's meant to be an autonomous, um, 
autonomous kind of weapon, basically. Um, and there is a rising threat at the moment of kind of lethal autonomous weapon systems, so much so that um, there's been a whole bunch of conversations tabled by the UN to try and put um, new legislation in place to kind of brand autonomous weapon systems. At the moment, we obviously have um, bomb disposal units. There was a classic case in America of um, an armed, um, uh, an active shooter being taken down by a, um, uh, by a bomb disposal robot. Um, which happened about a year, 18 months ago. That caused quite a lot of um, concern because the question is, well, what did the killing? Was it the human operator? Was it the robot? Um, obviously, because it was not autonomous, it was the human operator that finally had to kind of, you know, um, be cons considered the, 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 the perpetrator. But what happens when that human agency is taken away, when robots are able to kind of decide for themselves what they do? Um, in fact, you know, not wanting to get into kind of too much sort of politics, um, but I actually think the UN and particularly the EU, these big kind of like uh, pan-national kind of multinational bodies are the institutions that we need to rely on in order to kind of like stop things like this from happening. So, you know, one of the reasons I'm very, very disappointed about the way that the, uh, the way that the, um, uh, the, the Brexit discussions have been going is being outside of these kind of large organizations, having to have these kind of discussions that could bring in sort of international law, I think is sort of very harmful for our long-term uh, future. But ultimately, I think what we're probably going to have to do is have some kind of like UN-mandated version of Asimov's Law of Robotics. I'm sure you're all aware of Asimov's Laws, but just for the sake of, uh, of the video, I'm going to just play them here. The first law is as follows. A robot may not harm a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Number two. So, you know, we sort of joke these days about kind of Asimov's laws. They're very, very clunky. They're very, very basic. But I do think that at some stage we're going to see something similar enacted into kind of modern legislation. So this is one of the reasons why, in September, I took a, a group of 30 uh, designers, technologists, um, science fiction authors, researchers um, on a retreat in the, the sort of hills of uh, Norway. Um, and if you know your science fiction, um, some of you might recognize some of the scenes in this, um, in this movie is where the location was that we went to. And I'll kind of give you a little bit of a, a hint in a second. Um, but we went away to basically kind of decide what is the role of design in the kind of future of information, so artificial intelligence and robotics. Well, we came up with a list of around 30 or kind of 40 sort of precepts, which we called the Juve Agenda, because the name of the location was the uh, Juve, which is, is um, Norwegian for um, waterfalls. And, um, and we came up with this sort of great um, sort of collection of, of things. If you are in a process of designing any kind of automated system, you know, uh, artificial intelligence or not, it's worth considering the effects that, that, that your design decisions sort of make. And so if you're interested in finding more, you can just quickly go to something called the, the juveagenda.org, and that will give you a list of some of the things we came up with. We were only there for two or three days, so it was very, very rough. When we came up with it, there were about three or four kind of like AI manifestos floating around. Now there's about 30 or 40. We actually came back last year and did a review of all the AI manifestos that are out there. And quite impressively, R1 sort of captured more of the ideas of the concepts than any of the other ones. So if you combine them all, we basically kind of like managed to kind of like get most of the um, most of the sort of challenges. And yeah, if you're wondering, this is where the film Ex Machina was shot. So if film people are fans of science fiction, we went to the the the, the, the hotel where they filmed the movie Ex Machina because we thought it'd be a nice place to kind of go and and discuss the challenges. So. Jumping forward a little bit, you know, early robots of the 20s and 30s were largely curiosities. By the 80s, industrial robots have become common in modern sort of factories, lifting heavy loads, doing repetitive tasks at pace, without tiring, being able to work through the night. Um, this was a dream of many industrialists at the time who were worried about increasing labor costs. 
So actually, and the rising power of the unions, so there's no surprise that kind of robotics and automation and union power kind of like had a sort of a, an interesting kind of moment in the sort of the, the 80s. Back then, robots were largely confined to what's known as the four Ds, so focusing on jobs that were dull, dumb, dirty, or dangerous. Um, what has happened is this has improved um, both productivity um, and industrial working conditions over the last 50 years. <coughs> so if you go to a factory 50 years ago, they were dirty, messy, noisy, really unsafe places. Now, thanks to robotics, the, 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 the sort of the volume of kind of like, you know, um, harm that's kind of, you know, happens in these places is massively dropped down. A lot of that is actually because a lot of robotics happen in these cages. So these cages are sort of protecting people from being hit by these sort of giant arms. Because often these robots have no, or robotic arms, are just sort of filling a sort of a preset of, of activities and have no awareness of, of what's around them. Today, in some modern factories, robots outnumber humans 18 to 1. That's relatively common on, on kind of production lines. And we're slowly moving to what's become known as lights off manufacturing. Because frankly, if you have a workplace that's predominantly robots, why would you even bother keeping the lights on? Because they don't need it. And so we're going to see lots and lots and lots of, of, of buildings and warehouses and office spaces, you know, Amazon kind of warehouse floors where the lights are off. And you don't need heating, you don't need any of that kind of stuff because it's only there to kind of make humans feel comfortable. What's interesting is now we've hit a bit of a peak of productivity. Um, and so robots are now finding their way into other areas. There was a time when basically the cost of a robot was quite expensive. In 1990s, the cost of a robot basically hit the same cost as human labor. Now robot prices have been coming down while labor costs have been steadily been going up. So again, is it any wonder why industrialists, factory workers, and other sort of um, people that are reliant on the labor market are starting to look at robots as a way of massively reducing the cost? So you know, sectors like warehousing the last 10 years um, have been massively hit. I'm sure we've all seen the, um, the Kiva robots, which um, have uh, displace a large number of kind of, well not displace because Amazon is massively growing and Amazon has used these robots to scale. So Amazon still hires more people now than it did five or ten years ago, but the use of robots has allowed it to scale at a huge rate. And again, if you go visit an Amazon warehouse, there are whole areas where there are just the robots on the floor and all the humans kind of like skirt around the outside. Um, at the moment, we still need humans because these things go wrong quite often and you have to go and kind of pick these things up and repair them. But as things get more and more efficient, we're going to see things changing. And as we get, you know, kind of like um, increases in productivity, I think we're going to start to see mass underemployment. Now, not mass unemployment, but mass underemployment. I think we're going to see a lot more people um, having multiple different jobs. You know, the whole um, kind of like um, sort of portfolio career of people having two or three jobs at any one time, zero hour contract, all these kind of things are just going to get increasing, um, uh, increasingly common. John Maynard Keynes, you know, kind of had this idea, uh, economist, had this idea that by the start of the 21st century, automation would be so prevalent that we'd only have to work three hours a day to meet our fundamental needs. And yet, have we seen that? No. What we've seen is actually we're working more and more and longer and longer and harder and harder. So for some people, it's really hard to see a time when this kind of mass automation would lead to mass underemployment. Um, however, there is an argument to say that um, what we've done over the course of kind of like um, automation is we've automated, started by automating sort of baser sort of uh, attributes of humanity. So it used to be that we would use our physicality, our power, and then we would supplant that power to horse, and then to a small engine, and then a bigger engine, to create pumps, to kind of pump you know, water out of mines, etc., etc. Then we moved from like, sheer physical power to kind of dexterity, the use of the looms, and then we automated that. You know, you look at the kind of the 80s and a lot of AI and automation, a lot of kind of bringing in kind of like desktop publishing and, and computers into the office have been sublimating our, our mental ability to store, you know, dates, names, facts, figures. So we're slowly kind of, you know, whenever we kind of like supplement um, or make one part of our physicality redundant, there's always been another element that's kind of there to take its place. 
The question is what starts happening when um, robots and, and AI get so smart that, that it's actually able to do a lot of the cognitive functions that is kind of one of the few things that, 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 that humans still have left that can't be done better with robots. So there's some interesting challenges ahead. In the short to medium term, we're not necessarily going to be replaced by robots, but we will see ourselves working alongside robots. This is a, a robot called Baxter. Sadly, the company actually went bust recently. Um, but you know, again, a lot of people going using that as an example. Oh, robots are never going to take off. But if you remember the first dot com boom when people were saying, oh, you know, people are never going to buy shoes online, and now look how um, how prevalent it is. I think we're going to see more and more and more robots working alongside humans and vice versa. One of the really interesting things with Baxter is it wasn't a robot that required programming. You would basically, you could teach it how to do something just by moving its arms. You'd manipulate the arms. So let's say you're on a, on a conveyor belt and you wanted to teach it how to take cups and put it in boxes. You'd move the hand, you'd squeeze the clipper or gripper, you'd move it over to where you wanted to, to drop the cup and you'd open it up and it would do it. So you could program a Baxter robot in literally about five minutes. So there is an argument people say, well, like what happens when, you know, when robots come around, they're a place um, displace the workforce, but new jobs will be created. But, you know, is, is a job of, you know, training 50 Baxter robots to kind of move cups around, you know, that might take you a day or two. That's not necessarily going to overtake the job of 50 people that are working on a factory line. So there's some interesting challenges here. It's also worth pointing out that Baxter cost 22,000 US dollars. So if you were trying to figure out how to, you know, how to justify this, well, you buy this once, you have a, you know, maybe a 5K a year kind of you know, a maintenance contract, and it will work forever. At the moment, Baxter works about a fourth of the speed of a human worker. But again, we're going to see that changing, getting faster and faster over time. Um, so um, at the moment, there's a, there's a consultancy called Rethink that estimated that there were about 800,000 jobs currently in the US that could be displaced by these Baxter robots alone. Jump over to Asia. And uh, companies like Foxconn, apparently, who are the manufacturers of Apple Watches, Apple computers, Samsung phones, all these kind of things, reportedly recently replaced 60,000 human workers with um, these robots here. And you know, it's quite sort of charming that in the morning, the robots kind of do a little kind of you know, exercise regime with their, um, with their human kind of colleagues. Um, let me just play that back again, because I think it's quite a cute video. Um, and there's some really interesting interviews with the workers around how you, how you feel like working with robots. And interestingly, rather than them being worried, they were like, well, these robots are great because that person over there is really lazy and these robots are never lazy. So they work really hard. And actually, it means that I have to work really hard. But you could definitely imagine kind of like you slowly cranking up the speed, the robots are working faster, you're working faster, and then slowly you come into work the next day and Bob's disappeared and then Mary's gone and slowly more and more robots start appearing in your place. This is one of the reasons, again, why people like Bill Gates are recommending a robot tax. So there's some really interesting stuff going here. Again, like people like Bill Gates, billionaires, saying, hold on, there's a problem here. Like we make money to pay for pretty fundamental kind of things like healthcare, unemployment, schools by taxing labor. If that labor then gets removed from the workplace and goes to robots, shouldn't we be thinking about taxing the robots as well, the, the labor it's replaced? And this then feeds into the whole concept of UBI, universal basic income. Um, and I think, again, the EU are going to be one of the few political organizations that are actually likely to kind of push UBI through. UBI is not going to really happen in America, um, even though, weirdly, in America, on the fringes of both left and right, they think that universal basic income is a really good idea. For those of you that are not aware of universal basic income, the idea is that you use whatever your sovereign wealth fund is. So if you were like Norway and you had massive gas supplies, rather than um, giving tax breaks or paying huge amounts of money to a small amount of the population, you just give everyone a fixed wage, whether they're working, whether they're not working. You know, you give everyone a thousand pounds a month, two thousand pounds a month, and they can decide whether they use that money to start a company, whether they use that money to go and be a student, whether they use that money to do art, whether they use that money to go and study to become a nurse or a doctor. And there's a lot of really credible people now discussing UBI as one of the few ways that we can kind of get our way around the destabilizing effect of, of robotics automation in the next sort of 50 years. 
Whatever happens, I think it's important that we don't march into a brave new world um, where a significant proportion of humans are essentially just babysitting machines. It used to be the case in America that, again, humans would kind of like take, you know, um, you know, carry loads and, and kind of like travel and, 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 and deliver goods. And then the rise of kind of like pack animals. And then you'd find these situations where you'd have one human looking after five or six or seven pack animals. And the job of the human was basically just to feed and water the animals. Now these days you see humans doing the same thing with robots. So are lots of robots with their security robots, with their road cleaners, where basically the job of the road the job of the machine is to pick up rubbish, and the job of the road cleaner is just to basically stop kids from kicking the robot. Now, that doesn't feel like a very positive human existence, where your whole job is to look after the thing that is more expensive than you are. Um, but we're seeing more and more of these, um, these things happening. Fortunately, we've got a long way to go. As anyone that saw this new story would have seen, um, uh, an American security guard robot committed suicide. Um, uh, obviously it didn't, it kind of like got lost and it fell into this pool. But there was kind of a joke that like the, the, the job was so bad, even a robot wouldn't want to be a security guard, which again, I'm sure didn't make the security guards themselves feel really good. But you're seeing these things pop up all over the place in malls, you're seeing them in airports, little robots kind of, you know, giving people advice and kind of giving people directions. Um, and there's this kind of concept which is known as Amara's Law, which is that technology um, tends to be overestimated in the short term, but underestimated in the long term. So at the moment, we're sitting around kind of like really, really frustrated because we've got our kind of series or our Alexas, and they don't really do all the stuff that we really wanted them to do because we overestimated their abilities. But we also sit around and going, oh, yeah, these things won't be a problem in 20 or 30 years. We tend to massively underestimate their effects. So they get caught out by Amara's law. Um, <coughs> there's also this idea of uh, Moravec's law or Moravec paradox which says that it's relatively easy to create narrow AI that exhibits adult level performance on a specific thing, like an intelligence test or playing chess. So it's really, really easy to create something that plays chess, or more recently you've seen probably the AlphaGo winning against Go masters, or there's even a bunch of kind of like machine learning algorithms now that you can basically give them Nintendo you know, 64 games, and very, very quickly they'll learn how to master playing Mario. But they're trained to do one thing very, very well, narrow AI. We're a long way off from kind of like broad AI, general AI. Um, and that's probably not going to be here, you know, it's doubtful that general AI is going to be here in my lifetime. But we're going to see more and more narrow specialist AI taking away small, interesting parts of the, uh, the, the, the problem space. Now, on the other hand, it's very difficult, or often impossible, to create robots that have the skill of even a one-year-old. Um, when it comes to sort of general activities like, you know, movement, perception, etc. Um, and so I think it's going to be 20 to 50 years before we start to see the real effects of the fourth industrial revolution. However, um, I do think these effects will be a lagging factor rather than a leading factor. Um, and I just think it's kind of interesting, you know, it's all, it's all fun and games. We watch, um, you know, robots falling over. There's loads of online videos and YouTubes of robots falling over. But just remember that Google will be watching every time you watch one of those, and in 50 years, that might be used in court against you. Because obviously it's robot abuse and our robot overlords. That's why I'm saying I will, well, for one, welcome our robot overlords. It's a bit of a joke, but anyway. Um, so... As a result, we're kind of like, at the moment, we're kind of almost at the top of the hype cycle, the, the, the peak of inflated expectations around robots. And, you know, all the kind of like, you know, the, the flashy corporate videos um, really don't give a, a, a good example of um, what capabilities are like at the moment. <coughs> and I think we're sort of very, very quickly trending towards the, the trough of disillusionment. If you ever actually interacted with a Pepper robot, it looks amazing on these videos. In real life, it's quite a, an unsatisfying experience. But slowly, ever so slowly, we're going to start working our way out of the peak of uh, the, the, the trough of disillusionment into the plateau of productivity, like I say, into the 20 to 50 years. And I'm very much looking forward to this. You know, I'm hoping that when I get too old to look after myself, which I'm hoping won't be for another 40 years, um, that there will be some kind of home robot helper to look after me. And this is where a huge amount of robotics is being, you know, being invested in. Actually, robot home healthcare. Because gone are the days when, when um, 
you know, uh, family members generally look after elderly relatives, and there's a huge amount of strain as we're all getting older. We're putting a huge strain on the um, um, on uh, the system. And again, with the, you know the effects of Brexit, with a lot of kind of medical staff leaving the country because they're not invited here anymore, um, having robotic home help, I think, is going to be really important. And again, you know, if you can buy a, a robotic home help for 20,000, 30,000 pounds, and it can make sure you exercise, you take all your meds, etc., etc. That's probably going to be a damn sight cheaper than hiring a human being, which is really sad, but it is the way we're going. Um, a philosopher, Sherry Turkle, calls this our robot moment the point where robots step in to plug the gaps of our failing social support system and frayed community. Incidentally, if anyone hasn't seen this movie, it's called Robot and Frank. Has anyone seen Robot and Frank? One person, two person. It's an amazing robot, basically, um, an amazing movie. It's, it's set in the future, like 10 or 20 years' time. There's an old retiree who used to be our bank robber. Um, his family are really worried about his kind of like health and mental well-being, so they get him a, a home help robot, and they go on a series of adventures. And I won't tell you any more about it, but it's a beautiful, delightful movie. I highly recommend you checking it out. In the meantime, we're going to see an increasing number of robot toys, robot pets, robot assistants. Effectively, mobile versions of Amazon Echo, Amazon Alexa, but basically on wheels, moving around the house. Um, in fact, the first Alexa-enabled Android was sort of you know, unveiled you know, just for Christmas this year. Um, at the same time, you know, we're slowly getting better at imitating elements of human physiology. We don't have a robot that does it all really well. But we do have robots that can grip perfectly. We have robots that have got skin sensors that can sense you at touch. Um, we have machine vision that is getting increasingly good at detecting shapes, detecting people, even detecting emotions. Robots that can interact with humans, that can have cool conversations. Robots that can mirror human behavior and project emotions. All of these projects at the moment are siloed in different, different um, areas of academia. But we can definitely see how these things are becoming closer together. And again, like I say, 20 years' time, assembling into one single thing. Um, and a lot of it is around costs. The costs are coming down. I can't remember exactly how, Asimo, how much Asimo sort of cost to build, but Asimo is probably the, still the most advanced robot. And this was built 20, 30 years ago. Again, if you ever get the opportunity um, to go to Tokyo, the Tokyo Technology Museum, um, uh, they have, a, have a, 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 an Asimo show twice a day. Asimo comes out, he waves to the audience, he tells a couple of jokes, he kicks a football, he runs around, he does a little dance. Everyone loves it. Um, it does seem a little bit demeaning that like, the most um, uh, talented robot in the world basically is there to do a little 20-minute song and, song and dance show. Um, but again, it's, it's interesting how things are changing. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that the common narrative is always divided between utopia and dystopia. And if history has taught us anything, it's that the future is weirder and more mundane than we could possibly predict. For me, while there are clearly a host of social issues that we need to deal with, I also believe we have time on our side. And for one, I personally welcome our new robot overlords. So thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? You mentioned that robots that would give them guns and teach them how to kill. Them, yes. You teach them. We've already done that. They're called landmines. What's the philosophical difference between a landmine and a robot with a gun? Um, I mean, all of these things live in a continuum. Um, the difference is that at the moment, landmines can't make their own way under their own steam into a village, choose a target, and kill that target. Landmines are passive. You, you mine an area and people come to it. What we're dealing with now yeah, is... They still kill people, but they don't discriminate who they kill. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, you, know, you know, you could argue that there's no difference between cutlasses and machine guns. You know, you, there's no difference between machine guns and nuclear weapons. I would argue that there's a continuum. And you, it's much easier to um, kill things from a distance... Um, than it is to kill things up close. And it's much easier still if you set a bunch of robotic tanks off. You don't have to, you know, and the argument, a lot of it is the trauma. The trauma that, say, drone strikes take on um, the soldiers uh, piloting the drones. What you actually have now quite often is you have, you have civilian contractors flying drones where they get to the, the strike point. They then hand over to a military um, uh, uh, personnel who presses the button because the civilians, first of all, they can't kill somebody because 
you know, um, they're not part of the theatre of war and they're not sort of, you know, um, protected in that way. Uh, and also the, the kind of psychological scarring that it has. Um, if you move to fully autonomous sort of systems, then what you have is you have the ability for one very, very um, uh, technologically savvy company or a country to wage war from a distance where there's no chance of any civilians or sorry, any sort of military personnel getting hurt. I'm not saying that it's... Um, uh, it's a fundamental difference, but I'm saying what it does is it raises a whole bunch of you know, um, uh, interesting questions. So, for instance, if a autonomous robot accidentally kills a, 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 um, a, a village of civilians, who is responsible? Who gets taken to court? Who gets tried by um, you know, the, the Court of Human Rights? Is it the, the highest general? Is it the programmer at Google? You know, it's opening up a whole bunch of sort of difficult questions. Yeah, I accept that. We've got the same problem with cars. If a car kills somebody, it's an automatic mode. Who's responsible? Exactly. I mean, this is exactly the, it, the, the, the classic trolley problem. I mean, this is what's being debated at the moment. Um, how, do we, how do we navigate these new questions that come up? And, and these, are, these are not black and white questions. These are moral questions. And we could choose to decide as a, as a war-going sort of species that we don't mind whether there are in existence sort of auto, automatic sort of autonomous killing machines. Or we could decide that actually that is problematic and we will stop there. You know, we have decided as an industry that there are certain kind of, or as a, as a culture, that certain kinds of minds are permissible and certain kind of minds that do heavy non-lethal damage are now impermissible. We've decided that you know, targeting certain kinds of, of um, people is allowed, but targeting schools and hospitals aren't. So I'm not saying that there's anything new here in the sense that we've always had to have these challenges. This is just a new challenge that we need to kind of navigate. And different countries will have different levels of, of concern. Do you think there will ever be a um, I think that... I think that we will get to something that isn't a million miles away from the uh, sort of human rights laws and the, um, the, the, the laws that we have for dictating military uh, conflict. But also we know that, you know that there are countries that will flout those laws. Um, and we also know that there are countries with very, very large amounts of money that will um, be able to wage wars from a distance um, in a way that people don't get harmed and so the political friction for doing that will be reduced. And so, yeah, it's, 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 an in, it's going to be an interesting conversation that's going to develop over the next 20, 30 years. So don't you think the um, singularity of the world this is right in Carl's world? Oh, I, I mean, I think, the, I think the singularity is... So the idea of the singularity is we get to a point where general AI is so intelligent that it kind of meets or surpasses human capability. Um, I think that is a question that is not worth thinking about now. I'm not, not to dismiss the question, but I think a lot of people like Elon Musk are so fascinated by what might happen in 100, 500, 1,000 years' time, they're not necessarily worried or they're throwing off the challenge that we're going to be facing in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So I think that is a slightly more speculative future, which is fun to sort of geek out over from a point of, point of view of science fiction. The singularity is, if it even is a thing that exists, if it is possible, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Like I say, I'm, I'm slightly sceptical that we're going to have effective home help robots by the time that I die. I think the singularity is kind of, you know, it's... Somebody, somebody kind of likened it to... Um, worrying about, I can't remember what the specific quote was, but it's something along the lines of worrying about the human occupation of Mars damaging the environment. And yes, you know, eventually we might get to Mars, and eventually we might overpopulate it, and eventually we might damage the environment. But actually, there's a whole thing going on here now that probably we need to focus on a lot more and not worry about sort of slightly more sort of fanciful topics. Um, but it's interesting to ponder as a, as a thought experiment, I think. Um, I just had a question from, because obviously you come from a design background. Um, do you ever see a scenario where robots would be better at design than humans? Oh, absolutely. I think, again, it's really, it's really, it's really fun to do these talks because you can just say, oh yeah, 20 to 50 years and it doesn't really matter. Um, but I, I genuinely believe that what, what can be automated will be automated. 
And the areas that will be automated are going to be areas whereby it's really, really expensive to do a thing. And if you can get the automation to do it, even if it's only like 80% as good as a human, um, if it's going to be a third or quarter of the price, it will happen. There was already an attempt by a company in San Francisco called The Grid, which again failed, but just because one project fails doesn't mean all projects will fail, where they basically created an AI algorithm that was effectively creating automatically generated, effectively WordPress templates. But you would feed in what your company was, what you were selling. It would look at kind of like the behavior of your customers, and it would automatically redesign your site on the fly to meet the needs of those customers. And so every single site was kind of like fundamentally different based on some kind of machine learning algorithms. Now, again, you know, the videos never really quite um, came to life, and I'm sure a lot of it was kind of Wizard of Oz stuff, but actually, you know, kind of it wasn't probably as automagical as, uh, as you might imagine. But, you know, if that's where we are now, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I see no reason why large parts of design won't be automated. If you look at how design works at the moment, um, out most large companies now do not design things from scratch. Most large companies now have a design system, a pattern library, a pattern portfolio, and designers will go in and they will take these Lego bricks and assemble them. Um, most of the kind of like the, 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 the design patterns um, have been set. You know, most companies know what a carousel looks like, what a drop down looks like, what a what a, a kind of a news widget looks like. So it's not that, you know, beyond the realms of possibility that in the next three to five years, we're going to see very, very large, sophisticated companies like Google and Facebook automating large parts of that process. Um, so I think, I, I generally think that designers probably have, you know, I think we've reached peak design. And I think the design industry, as we see it now, has about 20 years, 10 to 20 years left. The way I see it is almost like, um, this is the way I describe it to, to my friends, whereby 200 years ago, if you wanted to buy a chair, you would go to the local carpenter, and they would make you a chair by hand. 20 years ago, if you wanted a website, you would go to the local freelance web designer, and they would make your website by hand. Now, if you want a chair, you go to IKEA. And one designer has created 50 designs and thousands and thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of chairs. So nowadays, the number of um, carpenters in the world has massively dropped. It's probably dropped by a factor of, of, of like, you know, 10 or you know, 90% sort of drop off. And I think the same will be true of designers. Like, I know very few freelance designers now in Brighton that are building websites for small to medium businesses because most of them are going to Shopify or Squarespace or buying, you know, WordPress templates. Um, and so one end of the market is massively dropped out and it's all being squished up. Um, and actually the opposite, I think, is weird, weirdly true, which is I think in a lot of industries, the middle of the market will be destroyed. There will be a bunch of jobs whereby they're just too cheap and nasty and, and kind of like fiddly that it's worth automating. And then there'll be a bunch of jobs at the top end of the market, which are just, again, too complicated and challenging and creative to be automated. But a lot of the middle of the industry will be hollowed out. And I think one of the reasons why people are starting to worry is, and again, it's, kind of, it's almost like a class war thing, which is um, when we were seeing heavy automation of, of blue-collar jobs, people didn't worry. When people started seeing automation of white-collar jobs, people didn't really worry that much. When people started seeing the automation of professional jobs, suddenly people start worrying. Um, you know, there are really, I think one of the first areas that's going to be massively hit is the legal profession. It used to be the case that when, a, when case law came about, you would have a whole bunch of paralegals, like, sifting through years, decades, like, you know, hundreds of years worth of, like, case law. Now what you'll do is you'll have a bunch of computer programs, algorithms, machine learning um, sort of software tools that will basically scan all this stuff for you and pull out the, the clauses, the, 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 the rules, the laws, the, the, the precedents that kind of are interesting. So rather than having, like, 20 paralegals, you'll have one or two or three paralegals that review all the information that the, the systems will kind of pull out. Now, there is an argument that says, well, that's great, because that means we can sue more people. You know, if we, we, if we don't need 20 paralegals, if we only need three, then we can use all those other paralegals to sue even more people. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, I'm not sure that does sound like a really nice world. Um, but there is the argument that, you know, we will find new jobs. But, yeah, I think, I think most of the people of my generation who are designers, who are now moving into design leadership positions, will have jobs for quite a long time. I think if you are a 14-year-old or 15-year-old considering becoming a designer, I do not think in its current form... Um, 
this will be an industry that they will retire in. I think they will probably end up having two or three careers. I think it used to be the case that we would have a, a job for life, you know, we'd work for a company for our whole lives, and then we'd have a career for life. I think now we're moving to a world where we'll have two or three or four careers and we'll switch every 20 years because the, the, the pace of change is going to be so much that, that whole new industries are going to be created and old industries are going to be destroyed. There will still be craft, there will still be artists and designers, like there are artists and um, cabinet makers. You would still be able to go and now pay £1,000 or £2,000 for a handcrafted wooden chair or cabinet if you are somebody that's got enough money that cares about the craft. But if you just want to get a Billy bookcase, and it makes much more sense to pay 25 quid, of which 50 cents of that will probably go as a licensing fee to the designer that created it. Any more questions? Um, when related to that, I've seen statistics about, um, about automation and jobs going away. There's actually a rise in anything to do with humans, like beauty and therapy is going up. So actually, you know, it's not something to be trained from one thing yeah. to another, but it's interesting that there is balancing out in different ways. Things that robots can't really do effectively. Yeah. I, mean, I think, you know, the, the, this is the kind of the Sherry Turkle quote around kind of like the robot moment, that it's, robots are stepping in when we're kind of like the fabric of society is breaking, which again is why, you know, we're at a point now in the UK where we can't afford you know, human carers, and we're finding it really difficult to attract human carers. So we can't get human carers from the UK, so we're having to attract them from overseas. And if that's cut off, then that's, that is potentially problematic. One of the interesting things, one of the reasons why I think that there's so much robotics and so much um, automation in Japan is because Japan has for a very long time been quite closed, particularly closed to immigration. And so for the last 20 or 30 years, the Japanese sort of government have been realising that with a massive ageing population, they do not have the people, they do not have the immigration, they want the immigration to support that. And so a huge amount of effort has been going into robotics. Over the last three or four years, um, in, a, you know, in, in a way to combat the challenges of Brexit, we've seen a huge amount of um, agricultural automation. So we're seeing a lot of people now working on on automated um, sort of fruit pickers. If you ever remember, there's a really terrible movie about, I loved it, called Runaway from the 80s um, with, who was the guy that played Magnum? Um, Tom Selleck. It's a terrible movie, it's really, really worth watching. And it starts with a scene where there's, he, he's, his job is basically to capture out of control robots. I think they basically saw Blade Runner and thought, let's try and do a Blade Runner ripoff, but it's done really badly. But basically it starts with kind of like automated kind of like corn harvester that like blows its fuse and just kind of go, runs amok. But it's kind of a fascinating movie. There's this kind of, there's this concept of paleoarchitecture, so paleoarchaeology. And paleoarchaeology is looking to past visions of the future in order to make sense of what's going on today. And, you know, that's why I'm really, really fascinated with a lot of um, old science fiction, because it gives you a hint about where we might be, might be heading. And so, yeah, we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing a lot of automation in, in all interesting places. And I think on one level, you know, there's always, you know, a silver lining. And I think... Um, some of these challenges will spur innovation. One of the things that the UK has been really, really good at is inventing things. You know, we invented, you know, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. Um, you know, we, you know, we invented the first robot. You know, we're very, very good at kind of like, pri you know, creating these kind of solutions to these sort of social problems. Um, whether we can then capitalise on them and um, scale them is a different matter. That's been one of the challenges we've, that we've sort of like not been so good at. But yeah, you know, I, like I say, I don't think it's utopian, I don't think it's dystopian. I think the world in 20 years' time will be both weird and unusual and different, but also very, very similar. I mean, again, one of the things that I mentioned about the Pepper robots is actually most of them don't work. You go into most of the soft bank stores in Japan, and they're kind of there, uncharged, kind of like with this sort of sad kind of look. You know, I can't get my fucking, you know, you know I can't get this to pair with that. And this is the one job it's been designed to do. So, you know, I think what we're going to actually have is we're going to live in a world where there's going to be a lot more broken robots and broken smart objects lying around, which again has its own kind of challenges. If any of you ever watched the movie Brazil, Brazil is wonderful because Brazil is this dystopian future where technology doesn't work. Um, and um, you know, one of my one of my favourite scenes of um, Red Dwarf is I don't know if you've seen. Um, I can't remember what it's called, it's not called Toasty the Toaster, but something like that, where there's, there's, there's a really, really annoying toaster that only lives to kind of make toast. And every time they kind of engage with it, it just 
give, give them a really hard time. Do you want toast? No. Do you want muffins? No. Do you want crumpets? No. And they keep turning it off because all it fucking cares about is toast. And so I think we are going to be living in a world. Like, there's this kind of idea, like one of my friends, again, Matt, Matt Jones talks about, is back in the 70s, you know, little LCD screens got created. So every fucking thing for about five years had an LCD screen in. I had a pen with an LCD screen in. I had like, you know, um, you know, yeah, kind of like a, 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 you know, really, really cheap calculators and, and all these kind of things. And then you have LED screens. Like everything at my home's got a fucking LED screen. I do not need LED screens in my, in my, you know, cooker and my dishwasher and my. And so I think what we're seeing now is AI is being coming or micro A is becoming the equivalent of like these little LCD screens. So we're increasingly going to have all these little kind of smart objects that are all going to be talking to each other. But because technology is weird, they're all not going to talk the same language. They're all not going to interface particularly well. And yeah, you know, that, that's why I say it's going to be weird but mundane. You know, I, 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 a great quote, like somebody, it wasn't somebody I know, but I was reading an article about by somebody that like bought, they bought like a 50 or 60 pound um, like smart plug. And then like a 70 or 80 pound smart light bulb. And then they hooked it all up to their, you know, their, their, their phone. And basically what you do is like, you know, I'm sure we've all done it. You walk into the house, you unlock your phone, you do the face thing, you navigate to your app, you turn the light on. And this person's wife said, you just spent 150 pound and you invented the light switch. You've got one there. You know, so we're going to see more of these kind of like weird clashes of, of kind of technology, these kind of shearing layers. Um, but it's interesting, you know, wherever there's friction, there's possibility, so. Okay, well, I'll, I'll leave it on that. So thank you very much. Thanks for bearing with me. Hope you found it useful. Um, yeah, cheers.